pleasure to introduce the president of Georgetown University, Jack DeJoya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cynthia. I want to express my appreciation to both you and to Derek Goldman for your leadership as co-directors of the laboratory for the global for global performance and politics and for the extraordinary work that you've been engaged in to bring us all together tonight. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with all of you and to be here for this extraordinary moment, Voices Unheard, Syria, the Trojan Women's Summit. I'm grateful for this opportunity to come together as a community and to celebrate the extraordinary women who make up the cast of this reinterpretation of Euripides' classic play through the lens of the contemporary conflict in Syria. I want to begin by thanking them and their translator, Shireen Zuma, who are joining us via Skype from Jordan. It's now 2.30 in the morning in Amman. Now, if they were here on campus, that would be one thing, but, <laughs> but um, they've left their homes in the middle of the night in order to speak with us to tell us about Syria, the Trojan Women Project, and more broadly about the Syrian conflict from their perspective as civilians and the impact of the war on their lives. We're grateful for their time, their courage, their willingness to connect with us and to share with us. I'd also like to thank the director of this production, Omar Abu Saba, Syria's leading theater director who will be joining us tonight from Beirut. The women in Omar Abu Saba will speak later in the program and be available for engagement with our audience. We're here tonight as Euripides' 2,000-year-old play about the brutal treatment of the women of Troy following that proud city's defeat by Athens resonated profoundly with Syrian women suffering under the conflict in their country. This extraordinary project reminds us, sadly, of the timelessness of war, but also of the strength of the human spirit, of human dignity. We all have much to learn from the cast and crew of Syria, the Trojan women. We're honored by their presence and by their stories. This is the third time that I've had the privilege to introduce a performance brought to Georgetown by the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics. The first was for artist Anna DeVere Smith's residency in March of 2013 that launched the laboratory. Last April, I was privileged to introduce and to watch Derek Goldman's moving tribute to Jan Karski, who came to life in Gaston Hall through the artistry of David Stratham. Leveraging Georgetown's dual strengths in performance and international affairs, the lab, a joint program between the college and the School of Foreign Service, has enriched our university and local communities. We're grateful for the way in which it has allowed Georgetown to more deeply contribute to the work being done at the intersection of art and policy, of culture and social change. Tonight, the lab launches a new effort, Myriad Voices, a cross-cultural performance festival, which is a two-year series of performances from leading artists from Muslim-majority communities around the world that will be accompanied by convenings, public forum, interdisciplinary courses, and the creation of new work. I look forward to the ways in which it will enrich our community. And now it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium Derek Goldman, Professor of Performance and Theater Studies, Artistic Director of the Davis Center for Performing Arts, and Co-Director of the Laboratory for Global Performance in Politics. Derek. statement to say that the existence and the impact of our laboratory for global performance and politics itself and this project in particular 
would not be possible without the support you have provided and the substantive affirmation of the importance of this work for Georgetown. To all of you here in the Gonda Theater and watching on live stream around the world, thank you for joining us. It's particularly moving that our voices are being heard right now via Skype by a couple of dozen cast members of Syria the Trojan Women gathered in Amman and in Beirut by the brilliant director of this project, Omar Abusada. We have been so deeply moved by his courage, vision, and grace in collaborating with us through this complex and often heartrending process, and of course by the courage and grace of the cast who you'll get to know some tonight. The outpouring of support for these women and the project from the Georgetown community, as you can see in this room, as well as folks from around DC, the nation, and the world has been amazing to witness. Tonight's event is not the event we envisioned. These benches were built for the ensemble of Syria, the Trojan women, to use in the production we hoped you would see fully embodied here tonight. And someday before long, we hope they will be used for this purpose. In the meantime, our Georgetown students sit as a kind of Greek chorus for tonight's event, citizens waiting, witnessing, participating. We learned just weeks ago that despite nine months of constant efforts and extraordinary advocacy on behalf of the women and the project from a wide range of top officials, ambassadors, legal experts, the U.S. Bureau of Consular Affairs in Amman denied the visa applications of the performers under Section 214B of the Immigrant and Nationality Act, failure to demonstrate non-immigrant intent. The Voices on Heard Summit is above all an act of solidarity with the women. It is an attempt to share all we are able to of this project that has so moved us and that strikes us as such a timely and urgent antidote to the picture of Syria created by the current ISIS-dominated news cycle. This event is born out of a conviction that we needed to do something, all we could, given the circumstances, to try to share this project and its implications with you. We're incredibly grateful to the wide range of panelists and speakers who've come together to participate tonight, and to Charlotte Eager and Georgina Paget of Refuge Productions, who you will meet soon, who conceived this extraordinary project and have been wonderful partners in every way. I hope you will indulge uh, a few extra special thank yous. Institutions like Georgetown are not known for their nimbleness and adaptability to change on the fly. And we, when we decided a couple of weeks ago that it was essential to move forward with the summit, it, it took a whole village of people to rise up to make this complicated global event even possible. So quickly, I want to thank from the bottom of my heart our amazing associate directors of the lab, Rob Jansen and Jojo Roof, who among other things have devoted hundreds of hours to the visa process in recent months under the brilliant and generous volunteer guidance of leading attorney Jonathan Ginsberg, who is here with us tonight. Our amazing staff at the Davis Performing Arts Center has risen gloriously and generously to the unique challenges this project has raised. Time prevents me from adequately recounting all they have done, but I need to say a huge thank you to our wonderful new tech direct, technical director and production manager, Michael Redman, for fearlessly, calmly, and expertly helping us figure out the very complicated technical dimensions of this event, along with Laura Mertens, Ellen Bateman, Toby Clark, Ronnie Lancaster, Ron Dignelli, Deb Savigny, among others, as well as our amazing chair of the Department of Performing Arts, Professor Maya Roth, for all they have done. This work is providing inspirational fodder for students in numerous disciplines on campus, as, as evidenced, I think, by who's here tonight. I also wish to thank the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World, the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, the Department of Arabic and Islamic Studies, the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, the Program in Culture and Politics in SFS, the Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, the Syrian Emergency Task Force, the United States Institute of Peace, and in particular our partners on this event, Bridges of Understanding. It truly takes a village to pull an event like this together. So I thank you all. The Syria Trojan Women Project speaks deeply to us both because of its extraordinary artistry and because we feel that the voices of these women, and by extension the voices of three million Syrian refugees, are almost entirely unknown and unheard by U.S. audiences. Um, 
The lab was founded to bring the world of performing arts and international policy together, and it's hard to imagine a project that better reflects both the immediacy and importance of this convergence and the complexity of this interaction. This process has surfaced for us the biggest fundamental questions about the role of artists and storytellers in crossing literal and figurative borders. Um, I want to close by just saying, uh, as we conceived tonight's event, we wanted it to reflect our idea of myriad voices. Above all, our hope is to share the women and the project with you, but we also have gathered a wide range of perspectives. As a result, it will be impossible to hear from every voice or to cover in depth all of the issues that will surface. The material is not only emotionally charged, but politically complicated. It's also true that we have tried our very best to rehearse and test all of the technical dimensions of what you will see tonight, but this is an extremely live event <laughs> with some elements that we cannot predict, and that's really the case, and it's, it's part of, I think, the excitement and the significance and importance. So we ask that you forgive us in advance, that we will be fairly relentless about the time in an effort to honor the schedule and to cover ground, and we ask you to sort of bear with us and to participate. Um, and we invite you at the end to join us for a celebration, just as the women are making this evening a celebration in Amman, that this is as close for now as we can come to being all together celebrating. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague and partner in the lab, Ambassador Cynthia Schneider. Thank you. Sometime last week, sandwiched in between emails from J. Crew and political candidates, came this message from the director of Syrian Trojan Woman, Omar Abu Sada. Very simple. Just, I'll be in Damascus for the rest of the week if you need to reach me. And I sat there and I thought, in Damascus, what does that mean? What can that be like? I have no earthly idea. And I wrote Omar back, who you know I have not yet had the pleasure to meet, uh, saying this. You know what? I'm just sitting here thinking, what can that be like? And he wrote me back, and I'd like to read to you what he said. He said. It's really so strange of mixed feelings these days. Huge emotions you can't understand. It's much more like the short moments before saying goodbye to someone we really love. End of quote. We hope tonight to give you a window into Syria and its people particularly those people who've been forced to leave their beloved homes and country, to give you some understanding of what they have been through and others have been through these last three terrible years. But let me tell you, this story tonight is not a tragedy. It's not like Euripides' play. It's a story of incredible resilience, courage, personal strength, friendship, love, humor, and joy. I hope that at the end of it, you will take away with you a deeper understanding of the incredible complexities of the Syrian com conflict today and its impact on all who suffered from it. I hope you'll also have a deeper understanding of the role that arts and culture can play in times of conflict. And I hope also maybe you'll leave with some ideas of different ways that we might be approaching foreign policy challenges. Let me tell you, give you a sense of the flow of the evening tonight. We are going to begin by introducing the project really in the, in the best way we can without the women being physically present to perform. Uh, and that is through some extraordinary footage from the documentary, and please watch for this when it comes out, the documentary Queens of Syria, uh, which Georgie Padgett is, is producing uh, about the whole project. So we'll first see that, and then we're so privileged to have one of the most renowned 
uh, radio broadcasters from Syria, Hani al Sayed, who has fled to America as a political refugee, and we're very happy to claim her. And she will interview the women, and so she will have a conversation with them. And then we'll invite you to ask them some questions as well. And then we'll broaden the discussion and bring on a couple of policy experts in Syria, as well as keeping everyone there. It's kind of a big tent on the stage, as you can see. Um, and we will hope to, we hope by then that you'll be at the edge of your seats. You may have laughed, you may have cried. And in the final discussion, we'll try to put it all together for you and, and give you a sense of how what you've seen tonight relates to uh, the relentless drumbeat in the media about Syria, which is mostly on ISIS. So hopefully you can leave with really a deeper, broader uh, understanding. It's now my great pleasure to get things started to introduce uh, our colleagues and uh, after this experience, lifelong friends, uh, Charlotte Eager and Georgie Pag Paget. Please come up, Charlotte and Georgie. Table. Together with Charlotte's husband, Willie Sterling, these three people conceived of this project as drama therapy and ushered it into the extraordinary production that it became. And now they'll share with us some of that experience. Thank you. زوجة عيد وأنا صغيرة الحلم إني مسل تي ماني مصدق إن الحلم اللي كان وقت أنا صغيرة إنه هلا رح يتحقق لما أنا عم بحكي عن بلدي وماني حابة أطلع بهالصورة هاي كنت حاضر مؤلما وروحوا تحنوا الى سعاده الماضي يعني هذا المقطع اكثر شيء ببكي احنا تركنا بلدتنا الاساسيه اثار كثير اخذ صرت بدي ادور حياه افضل لاولادي النص بحكي عن شيء حقيقي عندنا مع انه هو قديم بس التاريخ عم يعيد نفسه بالنسبه لهجابي كثير انا حسيت قريبه يعني هي زوجة ملك فرواضه فقدت كل اعتى الملوك يعني من عيلتها لاحفادها مثلنا نحن يعني كانت عايشه ملكه ببيتها، ما قالت انا كنت دير الملك وحركه كمفكوك يعني هلا شو؟ ونحن هيك صافينا. الهدف من هذا الشغل كله على بعضه انه نقدر كلياتنا مع بعض نوصل لنتيجه نقدر نساوي شغله. بغض النظر عن انتماءاتنا ومواقفنا السياسيه، ما عم تقدر الناس بسوريا تعمل شغله كلياتها مع بعضها. وما عندها حل غير انه تعمل مع بعضها، ما في حل ثانية. بالغصة اللي بقلبي صورة زينة وربطة. أو أنا لما كانوا قاعدين فيها بقابلين بعض. أنا نص رسالتي كان عم أقول والله الغصة بقلبي وكل ما قعدنا أنا وجوزي نتذكر البيت قاعدة أتحصل وأبكي. ومن ميجز بشوي طلعنا طلعنا وراح كل شيء. إخواننا ثلاثة والله تصاوب بال هاي الشيء بمجزرة صارت عندنا بس زينة والله من قبل هي كانت اللي انا ضدها تحكي وتطلع <تصفيق> خصوصا عن اخواتنا السوريات وكل وحده عم تتعرف على حياتها طبعا احنا تشنجت لا البيت بيتنا ولا المكان مكاننا ولا البلد بلدنا لا لا
Well, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming here tonight and for Cynthia and Derek for inviting us. My name is Charlotte Eder and I'm the co-founder of the Syria Trojan Women Project. With me is Georgie Paget, the co-founder and producer. As you now know, last autumn we put on a production of Europe's great anti-war play, The Trojan Women, with an all-female amateur cast of Syrian refugees in Jordan. It was Derek and Cynthia's vision to bring that play here tonight, but sadly our cast couldn't get their US visas. That play was the vanguard of the Syria Trojan Women Project. We're a multi-platform project aimed at helping individual refugees overcome their depression and trauma, providing some paid employment to Syrian professionals who've had to leave their country, and also raising international awareness of the growing Syrian refugee crisis, which I think tonight proves worked. We're being live streamed. And over 9 million Syrians have now fed their homes, according to the UNHCR. That's approximately 40% of the population and nearly 3 million of those outside Syria. The Trojan Women is a play about refugees. Euripides wrote this play in 415 BC as a protest at his home state Athens' barbarity after Athens took the neutral island of Milos, killed all the men, and sold the women and children into slavery. Apparently, according to Cynthia, many people in Georgetown today studied Athenian dialogues at the moment, which is the great speeches that Athens made for their ultimatum to Milos justifying their, their, their behaviour. But the Trojan woman is set at the fall of Troy. Euripides chose a myth his people knew well. He set it, he, he set it at that. The men are all dead. And the women are in a camp, awaiting their fate at the hands of the Greeks. But this time, and for Euripides' Greek audience, this must be very difficult, very confusing. The Greeks are not the heroes. They're the baddies. They violate and slaughter their way through the play. And there is a moral to this play which is beware of how you wage your wars, because if you behave with brutality, the gods will punish you. It's a very modern message being played out today in the courts of the International War Crime Tribunal in The Hague. Thanks to the generosity of our donors and the dedication of our Syrian cast and production team, that original project was an enormous success, both from a humanitarian point of view and an artistic one. And the idea for this project was dreamed up 18 months ago in April in a conversation with Oxfam, whose origins lie back in the past in the Bosnian refugee camps of 1992 and the slums of Nairobi in 2013. I'm a journalist. I'm a contributing editor on Newsweek. And in the course of my 25-year career, I've spent a lot of time talking to refugees in many countries. And I've noticed that they are often very depressed. Their old lives have vanished. They are now living in some sort of limbo. They still have their old vision of themselves, yet they are unable to come to terms with what their lives have become. If they live in refugee camps, where they are fed and housed, but unable to live normal lives or have normal jobs, then they are often also extremely bored. If they are living in towns, desperate to try and proclaim something who they once were, then they are often terrified, their money running out, forbidden to work legally, vulnerable to exploitation. Back in 92, my husband, the filmmaker William Sterling, and I were both working in Bosnia, where I was the Balkans correspondent of the Observer, the British newspaper. I spent all that summer talking to refugees. Then, when I got home, I'm a classics major, fresh out of Oxford, I turned on the radio and I listened to a production of The Trojan Woman on the BBC. I realised the stories I was hearing on the radio were exactly the same in this two and a half thousand year play, the ones I'd heard all summer. They were a violation of murder, exile, and loss. The tragedies of war are eternal, only the weapons change. Twenty years later, in the spring of 2013, Willie and I were hired by the UK department store Marks and Spencers to shoot at a series of training films, Leadership for Hope, for their Kenyan vegetable packers in Nairobi. The workforce all lived in Dandora, a slum built around rubbish dumps in Africa, the largest rubbish dump in Africa, the size of Central Park. We'd made a rom-com a few years beforehand called Scooter Man, which had got into Cannes and won prizes in America, but strange enough, we weren't living in Hollywood in a kind of palace in Beverly Hills, so <laughs> my Arabian and MS seemed pretty good news to us. But we thought the training films were quite boring, so we thought, well, we'll make them more interesting, we'll turn them into a mini soap opera. 
Each episode would have a different message. And we went over to Africa and we workshopped the script for a week with these slum kids who we were um, being provided by Marks and Fences to work with and with the families of their vegetable packers. And then we shot the soap on location in Zandora using these kids as the cast over four days. For our cast, it was both hard work and good fun, and they also got a bit of money. And over that time, we saw the transformation in England, their pride in their achievement, their realisation that life could offer them opportunities, and that they had the skills to take advantage of them, and the enjoyment and fulfilment they got from the project. Essentially, we saw the power of drama therapy. The cast also, possibly because they were playing themselves, or characters close to themselves rather, put on very strong performances. Uh, when we got back to the UK, I ran Oxfam, who I do a lot of professional journalist work with, and said, um, do you have any similar projects we could do with you, drama therapy? And the reply came, oh, we wish you could do something for our Syrian refugees. Now, my husband, like me, is a classicist, and we both immediately thought of the Trojan women. It was a play we thought which would not only allow our refugee cast to explore their own experiences, but like the guys we worked with in Nairobi, they could potentially produce something very powerful because they'd be playing something close to themselves. Originally, we were going to uh, do it very cheaply. We were going to go to Bethel Valley for six weeks with our cover commerce, do a play, shoot it, shoot it as a film in the ruins of the Bethel Valley. We were going to make a documentary about it, um, which essentially hedged the. Uh, the project and that documentaries thrive on conflict and problems. So the more problems we had, the better the documentary would be. Um, but uh, we had a stroke of luck. We went to Cannes and we put this idea up in a competition in the UK Film Centre, which we came second in. We always come second in this competition. And George was there one with a completely different project. And then she came on board as uh, our producer. And she's another Oxford classicist. She immediately understood the power and the relevance of the Trojan women and what we were trying to do. So things went up again. We hired the play off from the film, we hired a Syrian producer, Isab Azam. She found a brilliant theatrical director, Omar. Omar brought in his fantastic Syrian team, Nanda and Bissan, and also we brought in a wonderful documentary director, Yasmin Feder. So that put us out of a job directing the documentary. <laughs> and everyone did better with her. And our original intention was to work in a refugee camp, but we could not get permission to go into Zartri, the vast Syrian camp in Jordan. Now, of course, I beg you to, but they wouldn't let us in last year. So, anyway, I had a friend who was in the UNHCR in Amman, and he suggested that we work with urban refugees. He said the families dotted around the city in lodgings were often more isolated and more depressed than people in the refugee camps, who at least lived in a community. People in London were very generous helping us, give us money to do this, because this is all privately funded, but they were sceptical that we would make the project work. They said, aren't Muslims conservative? Would they want to be in a play? And I thought, well, how many Muslims have you met? That's a prejudice, a misconception. And also, amongst the half a million refugees in Jordan, I bet we can find 25 frustrated <laughs> exhibitions. <laughs> <laughs> Others said that Syrian refugees would not have heard of Troy, that we were being culturally imperialist, imposing a Western myth. Our Syrian producer, Itab, snorted with derision. Did they know where Troy was? It was in modern Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> you reckon these plays were performed for centuries in the Greco-Roman theatres, whose ruins dot the Middle East. And more importantly, for over a thousand years, those plays were kept alive in the libraries of Damascus, Istanbul and Baghdad, while our Western ancestors were grunting their way to the Dark Ages. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, all our women had heard of Troy. The educated ones knew the Greek myths, but the others all giggled and went, hee hee, rat pit. <laughs> <laughs> so you should be very grateful for them. Um, Isaac cannot be here today because she's currently in Beirut working on a similar production. But she found many of the women by going around Amman's refugee and community centres. She went to the UNHCR food queues. She went to Syrian refugee organisations, going up to total strangers and saying, hey, do you want to be in a play? So on the first day of our workshops, we were sitting in this... Uh, community centre we'd rented in a rather dodgy part of downtown Amman, um, uh, waiting to see if anybody would turn up. And we sat there, and we sat there, and we sat there, and nobody came. It was like giving a very unsuccessful party, and <laughs> it had said, I can't bear this anymore, I'm going to go downstairs and see if there's anybody there. And I sat there, terrified, and um, thinking, what am I going to do with all this money that we've been given help? And then she came up like with this enormous smile, like the Pied Piper, leading for 12 
rather nervous looking women behind her. And we had 18 that first day, and I thought, good, we can put the play on with 18 people. And then the next day we had 25, the next day 35, the day after that we had 50, and then we had over 100 trying to join us, and we had to turn them away. We, we didn't have the space or the budget. We also had to run a daycare centre for our cast children, um, who were 50 traumatised toddlers. We even had a six-week-old baby called Sham. Uh, we'd, uh, that was almost the most challenging part of the project, actually. <laughs> we collected toys from our friends in London for the children. Um, our friends' children will have too many toys. And uh, well, my most scary moment of the entire thing was when we had a suspected measles epidemic. But luckily, it was unfounded. And we also brought a Syrian refugee psychologist on board, and he gave the women and children counselling. And his practice continued to work with the women uh, pro bono for some time after the play was over. And Omar, the director, worked the women's own stories into the play, which the women told us they found very, very cathartic. They said they had finally been given the chance to tell their stories to the world. Because when you're a refugee, something terrible has happened to you. Every single refugee has suffered a dramatic event in their life that would make a Hollywood movie, but nobody's listening, nobody wants to hear. And this is what our women were able to do in the play. Then we put the performance on in the Man's National Centre for Cultural Arts in two feet of snow. This was our final challenge. Uh, we had the worst weather in the Middle East to see for over 100 years. The theatre was on top of a hill, there's no central heating, and the buses couldn't reach the theatre anyway. We thought we might have to postpone the play, but the women said, no way, they'd walked out of Syria. They weren't going to be put off by a few feet of snow. <laughs> so, just as we'd seen in Nairobi, but in a much more prolonged way, during those seven weeks of the workshops, we saw the women we were working with change. On that first day, they were nervous and stressed, clutching their handbags and their children, which was virtually all they left Syria carrying. But by the end, they were busy, self-confident career women. And it was the same with the children on the first day. Um, we'd got all these toys for them, Barbies and cars and things, and, and the children had, were not used to playing with other children, and many of them had just spent, you know, they were young and tiny, but they they were very traumatised and they'd just been alone with their mothers cut off in these lodgings and um, they completely dismembered all the toys. There were just these sort of Barbie's heads and arms lying absolutely everywhere. And it did look like a terrible plastic war zone. Um, but by the end of, of six, seven weeks they were happily playing with each other and uh, apart from nearly mocking my husband when he became Father Christmas and handed out the remaining toys at the end. And as for the women, we realised that by the time the play was over, Instead of being alone and frightened in a foreign land, they had created a new community for themselves. Many of the women described the other cast members as a new family. And the performance they put on was electrifying. It's a tragedy they can't be here today. It's quite, quite extraordinary. And it became apparent that the performance helped not only the people in the cast and the production team, but many people in the audience told us, Jordanians, Syrians and others, that it helped them have a much greater understanding of what it was like to be a refugee. But they themselves have found it cathartic and helpful. <coughs> the UNHCR is very keen for us to film our production so they could take the film on tour of refugee camps. They wanted to tour the whole play, but it is impractically expensive to take 25 Syrian actors with their children for 10 weeks on tour around the refugee camps in the Middle East. The revised plan is to do a new production in one of the ancient Roman theatres in Jordan and film that, funds permitting. And then the UNHCR can take the DVD on tour, which will be a lot easier. The play has also achieved our other aim, and frankly, beyond our wildest dreams. It has helped generate publicity for the refugee crisis. The play was covered by everyone from the BBC World Service to Al Jazeera, Newsweek, Reuters, to the FT, France, Der, The Guardian, Correo de la Star, Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya. The awful truth is that Syrian refugee has a terrible time is not a surprising thing. But Syrian refugee puts on a Greek tragedy, now that, that's news. As you know, we shot a documentary of the project, you've seen the trailer of the documentary before I started to speak. Georgie's going to show you some more clips. And now, of course, I'm standing in front of you today, pleading the case for Syrian refugees, thanks to Cynthia and Derek. And the good news is that our Syrian cast have now got their Jordanian re-entry permits. So with any luck, they will be able to come to Georgetown, after all. They've also got visas to perform in Switzerland, in front of CERN in late October. As for our project, we're expanding. We're currently producing an educational soap opera for refugees supported by the UNHCR. It deals with the issues facing refugees in Jordan and is being written by a Syrian and Jordanian team. 
We've been asked by UN Women to do a new play in Zafri Cap, and by a private donor to design a drama therapy musical project for refugee children in Amman. We're going to do Joseph's amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, and then we hope for Paul's album. <laughs> if you can't take a quiet, Syrian refugee children scene, I close my eyes, hold back the curtain, to number one, what can you do? <laughs> and the money raised can go to help refugees. And actually, wonderfully, yesterday I got an email from our paymasters in Nairobi telling me how inspirational the films we shot last year have been. They've now been seen by over three quarters of a million people, and they've asked us to do another programme with them. As for the film version of the Trojan Women, which is where we began with our hope of this little video camera and the cup of hummus, um, we've updated it, it's got much bigger, it's set in a modern, unnamed Middle Eastern war, with all the panoply of a contemporary conflict. The gods are members of the United Nations. We have Admiral Poseidon, head of the military mission in Troy, sparring with the Russian Huet, UN head of civil affairs, Pallas Apanova. We have journalists, live from the fall of Troy, and the anchor TV debate. And the script is a third in English. But the grim drama at the heart of the film between the Greeks and the Trojans, that's in Arabic. We've got an award-winning British director, Dick Tinnerhood, and an amazing cast. And we're due to shoot in March, on location, <coughs> in Jordan, in the, ruin, the Greco-Roman ruins of Jerash and a refugee camp. And we very much hope that the women who are in our play will play the chorus. We also hope that as many of the extras as possible will be Syrian refugees, continuing this idea of the project of providing a degree of paid employment. And we hope the film will create waves of publicity for the Syrian refugee crisis as a whole. Because nine million people who have lost their homes cannot be forgotten. If not just for humanitarian reasons, then for the pragmatic. They will breed conflict for generations to come. The conflict in the Middle East cannot be mended piecemeal. They must be looked at holistically. We cannot allow ISIS to recruit these vulnerable and abandoned young people in these camps. But tonight is about our original Trojan women, our amazing cast and the play they put on. So now I'm going to hand over to Georgie, who will show you some of the film we shot, and then you will get the chance to meet the women themselves on Skype. Charlotte's thanks uh, to Derek, Cynthia and their truly amazing team here at the lab who've worked so incredibly hard to put tonight's event together. Um, it really is a great shame that our wonderful cast can't be here to join us but I can't tell you how excited I am at the prospect of in a moment seeing them on the screen here behind me. Um, so you all know you won't be watching the play tonight uh, but what we do have for you um, are some extracts from the documentary that Yasmin Feder shot uh, in Amman last year. Um, as Charlotte said, the documentary documents the process uh, from the creation of uh, this unique performance right the way through to actually having it performed uh, on stage in Amman. Uh, we follow the group from the workshops at the rehearsals uh, right the way to the opening night. Um, and we'll be able to hear a bit more about that uh, from the cast themselves a little bit later. Um, but what we hope that this documentary also does uh, is to provide another platform uh, another medium for this inspirational group of women to tell their stories on a wider international stage. The perspective of ordinary Syrian women affected by this conflict and the refugee crisis is so often markedly absent uh, from media coverage. But Yasmin had the great privilege, uh, as the rest of us did, um, to get to know these women over the course of seven weeks. Um, she was there for all the rehearsals, uh, all the workshops, and she even actually went home uh, with some of the women, uh, home to their families, got to know them, and the conversations continued, even after the workshops were done for the day. I'm not going to say too much more than that, because the point of this documentary is to hear from them. Uh, but in case anyone hasn't quite taken it on board yet, um, none of our cast had acted uh, before this project. Um, in fact, only a couple of them had ever been inside a theatre before. So it's in that context as well that you can uh, view their remarkable achievement. Uh, so I'm going to begin by showing you a clip from very early on in the workshop process, uh, where Omar is asking for volunteers from the group to make a tableau of a moment in their lives back in Syria uh, where they felt uh, they had experienced injustice. And our first contribution is from Fatima and her group. This is the 
why they got involved with the project and uh, their experience of it. Um, but just to tee that up a little bit um, and, and give you a flavour of what that was like, uh, we're going to hear uh, from one of them, Suad, uh, as she tells uh, her husband when she goes back home uh, how her day has been. حربت دموع يا صديقاتي فمن تمنحني عيونها كي أبكي بها خيام ألا يولد إنسان أصلا أو أن يكون ميتا فالموت أفضل من حياة الشفاء الموت لا يشعرون بأي ألم ولا يعرفون الحزن بينما ذلك الذي عرف السعادة ووقع بعدها في الشقاء فإنه سيشعر دائما فإن روحه هائمة في ذكر الهلاء الماضي إن مأساة الإنسان الحقيقية تظهر حين تصفاه يد القدر القاسية فيعيش حاضرا مؤلما وروحه تحن إلى سعادة الماضية
and as you see written in your pamphlets as well, um, says, I have a scream, I want the whole world to hear, but I wonder if it will resonate. So I hope tonight will resonate for everyone. After the conversation, there'll be uh, some time, I hope, left for a few questions from the audience, mm. also uh, to the Queens of Syria. So with that being said, please join me in a warm welcome the Queens of Syria and Director Omar Abu Sada, all of whom represent the true meaning of nothing is impossible. So, Ahla <laughs> Sada. I'm asking the ladies and Omar, how did you feel when you received the invitation to perform in the United States? And then again, how did you feel when the visa were rejected? My name is Fahma and I'm from Syria. I'm uh, happy to be here. And we were so happy when we received the application uh, to the state. Um, and, um, we were here uh, to talk about uh, suffering. Sorry, but there's a technical problem. We 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 hear our echo, so it's hard for us to speak and translate. I don't know if you can solve it, but we're trying our best here. Uh, uh, shall, I, shall I translate what Maha said now? Okay, I, I, I will try my best to translate, and then please do correct me if I um, miscommunicate anything to the audience. Is that okay, Shireen? Yes, yes. Because well, I, can also, I can also barely hear, um, I, can all, I can barely hear the answer, but I'll do my best. So let's, 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 um, yeah, let's, let's go ahead. Um, Uh, 
لكن عندما عندما ذهبنا على السفاره الامريكيه وبقت يعني رفضونا بس لانه نحن لاجئين سوريين اعطونا شعور احباط يعني كثير يعني في قلوبنا بس لانه نحن لاجئين سوريين يعني نحن كنا كل شيء في بلادنا بس هون صرنا ولا شيء يعني ما بعرف يعني شو ذنبنا انه نحن هلا حاليا لاجئين ونرتفض انه نطلع يعني نوصل صوتنا للشعب لعل لعل وعسى يعني حدا يسمعنا سما حاول ترجم هلا طبعا الصوت صار اوضح على فكره شيرين اذا حابه نحاول بس مره واحده معلي بليز هوني كملي اذا Um, Sama uh, was saying that um, they really wanted to come to the United States. They had a message to everybody here, uh, and to the West in particular. They wanted everybody to know how, uh, how much they had suffered, the dire situation they were in, why they were forced to leave, and what they had to go through, and the fear that's in their hearts that they carry with them all the time. Um, And, and they feel really sad and brokenhearted that their visas were rejected. Um, just because they are refugees, it is not their fault. They were somebody back home, and today they feel there are nobody, and this incident made them feel that even more. Um, and all they want is really to relay the message to you and to humanize themselves as well. Shireen, is, uh, I missed on anything. Please let me know. No, perfect. I think Fatma would like to speak now. Sorry? I think Fatma would like to speak now, um, answering this question, if she, if she can. Yes, please, and then we'll go to the next question for time. Okay. Okay. Fatma, I was one of the people who were in the Syrian Syrian أنا فاطمي إحدى مشاركات الرواضيات سورية بتحبي فاطمي تجاوبي على السؤال؟ إيه بحب إنه يعني نحن وقت اللي إجتنا الدعوة لأمريكا للسفر فرحنا إنه رح نزور أولا بلد كبير وعظيم مثل أمريكا بالتالي انه رح نوصل الرساله يعني بشكل اسرع يعني للعالم ولحتى انه الكل يحس بمعاناتنا يعني ويوقف جنبنا و... ويعطينا شيء اكبر من الدعم يعني يعني نحن انهضمت كثير من حقوقنا ومن يعني نحن كان الرفض تبعنا مجرد بس انه نحن لاجئين و... ومهجرين يعني شعب مهجر ولاجئ شعرنا بصدمه كبيره وقت اللي رفضنا بالسفاره الصراحه. اوكي. Okay. Um, فاطمه شكرا كثير على على الجواب. فاطمه um, was wanted to also answer to the first question that I had asked in, in regards to the rejected visas to the United States and she said that really it was a dream for them to come and visit such a great country, an inspiring country like the United States. And, um, and they felt that it would have been a way to relay their message even faster by being physically here in front of the audience today and, and to have everybody feel how much they're suffering and how much support they really need, not just financial but moral support. And there's so much injustice that has been upon them that they feel that it's even more injustice to have their visas uh, rejected. And, and from here I'm going to go on to the next question. Um, أنا بدي أسأل سؤال لعمر ما بعرف إذا عمر معنا. أنا بتمعكم عم تسمعوني؟ عم نسمعك، أهلا وسهلا عمر. أهلين هلا. عمر ليه اخترت هالمسرحية وهل فكرت يوم ما ما إنه حيتم عرضها وكيف أثرت فيك شخصيا وأنا حترجم السؤال بالإنجليزي. I was just asking uh, the director, uh, Omar, why he chose to do this play and if he ever thought that one day it could even be produced and how it has affected him personally. Tadar. I Omar, can you hear me? ايه عم تسمعك عم تسمعيني؟ ايه بس بدي اسالك بتحب تحكي بالانجليزي ولا نكمل مثل هيك بس مشان الوقت مشان ما اخذ وقت بالترجمه اذا بدك اوكي اوكي اي ويل سبيك ان انجلش 
I want to add. Uh, I want to add something uh, uh, to answer uh, the first question that the woman was uh, answering now. I just want to say that uh, for me, I, mean, I didn't really expect that the woman uh, uh, will take the visas from the first. I, I didn't feel uh, they will take the visas because. I think uh, I think uh, now the situation in the whole world is really I mean, so complicated, and uh, and this will affect people uh, somehow. So I really didn't think uh, they will take the visas. I know it's so hard, and uh, and now I think uh, now when I am here now and speaking uh, with you by Skype and uh, also woman. Uh, Speaking by Skype, and I cannot see audience, uh, cannot talk to them. I think that uh, all of us, uh, yani the women uh, who are the actors of this play, and the audience uh, lose uh, lose uh, yani very important opportunity to be together uh, in one uh, in one space that is the theater and uh, interact. Uh, in live way directly, which is, uh, uh, I think, which, uh, this uh, this is the essential uh, part of the theater to this uh, human uh, live interactive. So I think it was like a lose for all of us. Amar, uh, 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 Okay, so what can I I'm I'm Okay. 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 Actually, uh, I didn't choose this uh, play. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think, uh, yani the last year, Aitab um, Azam uh, and uh, Charlotte uh, and Georgina, uh, William also, all of them uh, called me and they emailed me that they have this idea about a project about uh, to making uh, to make Trojan woman. By the text by Euripides, uh, and try to perform it with, uh, to perform this using uh, uh, an uh, non-professional actors. Uh, they want to use uh, women who uh, who really have uh, this war problems and uh, and ask me to direct the play. And I think uh, in that time I thought it's really very good, you know, it's really brilliant idea. So I start to work on it. So the whole idea come from from them, not from me. Mm -hmm. And how did it affect you personally? Keep us a little bit I think um, uh, uh, at the first, I want to say that I direct is affect me in some way, but uh, but this one was really very special. Uh, Yani yeah, really so special work because uh, because uh, it uh, yeah, it happened in uh, yeah, in very intense moment of my life and uh, and uh, intense moment for my country Syria so uh, so it was uh, yeah, it was uh, so important ex experience for me it was hard. Uh, Sometimes it was very sad. Sometimes, but it also was come for always fun and happiness. Sometimes, uh, and uh, yeah. and I think uh, I think uh, that me and uh, and uh, and the cast who work with me, Lisan and Nanda and the woman, all of us uh, at the end uh, succeed succeed to create. Uh, of uh, freedom and uh, uh, and art uh, for two months, which, which was really so important for us. Mm -hmm. is, شكراً شكراً عمر. طبعاً حنتابع الحديث هلا وحكمل إنجليزي وعربي. فبس دي فرصة للترجمة أكيد. 
قبل ما نواصل الحديث عن المسرحية نساء طروادة أنا حابة تشاركونا ملكاتنا السوريات يلي عم يسمعوني ولو بحكاية واحدة من رحلتكم الشجاعة من سوريا للأردن ليش تركتوا؟ شو كان عم بيصير؟ وكيف كانت حياتكم بالأردن قبل المسرحية وما بعد المسرحية؟ My question was um, to the queens of Syria. Uh, before we continue talking about the play, uh, the Syrian Trojan women, please share with us your courageous journey from Syria to Jordan and why you were forced to leave Syria, that and what was your life like in Jordan before the play and now after the play. بسبب الأحداث وصارت المشاكل والحروب مع الجيش النظام والجيش الحر وصار كتير يعني إنه مشاكل ونحنا كنا من دون سبب نتعرض لشغلات كتيرة يعني كنا نحن الضحية اللي بين الجهتين فيهم إن قررنا إنه نطلع بأولادنا الأفضل ودشرنا بيوتنا وغراضنا وكل شيء ممكن نأمن على حياتنا وعلى أولادنا ما لقينا بطريق مجال معانا بسبة إنه معانا جوازات لقينا أقرب شيء إنه هو الأردن أيوة ولما وصلتوا على الأردن كيف كيف كانت العيشة كيف شو اللي عملتوا لا تدرسوا إحنا أول شيء أنا يعني طالعة بجوازات أنا بحسب إلي نظامية يعني أيوة. بس الأكثرية طالعين إنه مو نظاميين كتير تعذبوا بالطريق بس كتير تعذبنا وتلبكنا لحتى إنه صرنا جوات الأردن كتير كتير عانينا بالطريق وبالحدود وبال بالسورية وبالأردنية في شيء قصة تحكي لنا يا شو أكثر شيء عانيتي عانيته أنا جوجي لما إجا طلع على طريق إجا لهون وصل على حدود الأردن ما رضوا يخلوا يفوت إجا لحاله أم رجع وطلع من على طريق على سوريا على لبنان وطلع من لبنان بالطيارة لأن إجيت أنا بولادي وبدي فوت ما خلاني نضابط على طريق سوريا بالجوية على الطريق كتير يعني أهاني وزلني اللي ما في فوت يقول لهم شان الله مشان النبي بوس إيدك بوس إجرك أنا ما معي حدا عندي ولد عمره 14 سنة وبنت عمره 6 سنين ضليت من الساعة 6 الصبح للساعة 10 بالليل لحتى أني قدرت أني يفوت وأنا أترجع آخر شيء يعني فوتني يعني حتى واحد عم بكب التاب قلت خلاص قلع كنت لجوة يعني كتير حسيت أنه بصعوبة وإهانة يعني أنه إنه ابن بلدك ومن بلدك بنتي هي على حدود هي على حدود أنا بس مشان حترجم أمار can't hear you honey it's not cutting off okay Amar was just answering to the question saying that they were forced to leave Syria as civilians they were caught in the middle of the fights between the Free Syrian Army and of course the regime's army the Syrian Army and um, and they and they had to leave. They they just fled with nothing but their children, of course, and their families. They faced a lot of obstacles and challenges uh, on the way, which uh, made them feel very fearful, of course, and especially at the borders, they were insulted. Uh, although Amar, in her case, she feels lucky that she had a passport on her. There are many other refugees who had to flee without their passports, and they and they had to face even more trouble. Amar had to uh, split with her husband, so in moments like that, you never know if you're going to see each other again. 
Uh, they didn't let him in at the borders. He had to flee again through uh, Lebanon and go in from there. And when she reached the border, she couldn't get into the borders um, due to the uh, Syrian army. And they were insulting her, and she was begging them from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. in the evening with her kids on her lap, just trying to get into the uh, border until they kind of physically threw her in and telling her to go. Um, so that's, uh, that was uh, Amar's answer. My question was, uh, how did this play change their lives and what did it feel for them to, for the first time to actually be on stage? I have to ask because the sound was cutting off. Uh, would you like to ask Amar or would you like to ask someone else? Someone else would be, would be, so we can get to meet all of, all of them, please. Anybody there, if possible. Okay. Uh, this is Reem. Reem, I know Sahila Reem. Has it been in English? بس الصوت عم يقطع عندك انا اسفه لا اكون انا فهمت السؤال خلص مو مشكله يلا اوكي بالحقيقه هلا لا انا ولا اي حدا ثاني من يمثلوا معي بال بالمسرحيه مثلوا قبل هلا فهي كانت تجربه جديده وفريده من نوعها اول مره احنا بنعمل هيك شيء واللي كنا نحن نتامله انه ي... يتغير بحياتنا انه نحن نوصل صوتنا، صوت الناس يلي ما وصل صوتنا، يلي هن نساء، يلي هن يلي ما حدا بيحكي باسمهم لا بالاخبار ولا بالصحف ولا باي مكان ثاني. فانا حسيت انه المسرح وهي المسرحيه بالذات ونحن بالذات قدرنا نوصل هذا الصوت. Um, so Reem was just answering the question saying that truly none of us have ever acted before and this is a, a new and very unique experience for us. It has changed a lot for us and it gave us hope that perhaps we can change uh, the, the way people perceive us and, and per perceive Syria and, and ex especially change for women because women's voices are so marginalized, especially during conflict and maybe through this theater play and, and through media we can um, you know, deliver that message and, and, and help empower women. عندي سؤال عم تقولي سينديا نو عندي سؤال أخير. فا فا. Do we have time for other? Yes. Okay. Alright. عندي كمان سؤال أنا حابة أسأله إذا فيني على سريع عمر أسألك سؤال وآخر شيء أسأل ال النساء والثاني. Okay. 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 عمر عمر بدي أسأله إذا فيك جاوبني على بأسرع طريقة ممكن إنه بهذا المشروع كان. كان مشروع حساس سياسيا، إذا فيك تحكي لنا عن العقبات والضغط السياسي اللي واجهتهم خارجيا وداخليا. I'm asking Omar, the, the Syrian uh, theater director, uh, that this has been a sensitive project politically. Uh, would you share with us the challenges you have faced, especially external and internal uh, political pressure? Omar, uh, إذا فيك تجاوبنا بالإنجليزي بكون ممتاز. Yes, I'll be, uh, as you said, it's really very sensitive uh, project and in sensitive time, really. And uh, and all of us as Syrians or as uh, individual uh, uh, artists, uh, independent artists, uh, have uh, have too many pressures uh, come from like from everywhere uh, when we start to work on uh, uh, on any. Any political issue, man. Uh, 
which uh, reflect our life uh, right now. Uh, I think we have to. Uh, I think uh, that we have too, uh, you know, too many problems, too many challenges uh, during this war. Uh, and yeah, I could say uh, as an example was one experience. Uh, maybe the people now in uh, Washington DC remember. Uh, uh, in one point, when we was working, uh, I think uh, uh, the the producer, uh, Charles and uh, William, uh, have uh, have like the pressures from uh, I think from um, from from NGOs who are specialized to work with the refugees. Uh, just to, uh, they, uh, I think they asked them not to mention Bashar al-Assad in this play. Uh, uh, they want to, uh, to uh, yeah, they want us to do it, but without mentioning. And uh, and uh, so they came to me and said that uh, we are asked uh, not to mention Bashar al-Assad yani, in this play in any way. And uh, I think it was so hard situation for all of us because uh, because I uh, I didn't want to uh, to uh, yeah, need to make any censorship on the woman because uh, from the first time we enter this uh, space we promised them that this will be two months freely and freedom and they could uh, express themselves they could say whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, this was uh, one was a hard experience. At the end, I mean, at the end, uh, the producer was really understanding, and uh, and, and, and you keep going uh, in the same way. I mean, I didn't change uh, anything, and uh, and the woman didn't change any stories. We didn't make any cuts, and we make it uh, really in free way. But I think uh, we had some like three, four days with with too much pressure until I. Yeah, and until you figured it out. Omar, exactly. I, I just, real quick, if you can tell me what were the, the internal p political pressure, the داخلية شو كان عم بيصير من من ضغط سياسي الحكاية اللي ما بحكاية عنه. Yes, yes. بس uh, um, yes. This is also so, so important because uh, you know uh, the women come from different backgrounds. And they have uh, different experiences. They are not the same. I mean. uh, yes. And uh, and they even uh, uh, each of them have different point of view of what happened in Syria now, of what happened now in Syria. They are really um, different. So uh, so you know it wasn't so easy to us, uh, especially I mean, about uh, two weeks I think before uh, opening uh, night. Uh, uh, yani, uh, it wasn't easy for us to uh, to yani, to be uh, yani, to that all of us agreed on one message of uh, of this war, and uh, and some of them want to cut from this story, some of them want to cut something else. Uh, yani, it, uh, it was really not easy. So at the end, uh, I remember that we said. Uh, uh, we said, uh, this uh, this play is like uh, like like uh, you can see, I mean, it's like uh, like a metaphor. I think uh, want to make uh, to let this play happen. Uh, all of you have uh, have uh, to to be agreed. All of you have uh, to be agreed on one thing, you know? and uh, and it works really at the end, you know? because because I think uh, the, I think now the, because the woman was really uh, very responsible and really very brave. Omar, uh, check out thank you, Omar, very much. And, 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 and to all the ladies, obviously this has created a space for uh, freedom of expression and dialogue and to help all Syrians um, uh, unite. They are united. <laughs> but to, to be able to make it uh, on stage, and, and unfortunately you're not here today in Washington, D.C., but you will be soon, I hope. Um, we have um, uh, space, I guess, for two questions uh, from the audience, if anybody would like to ask from the audience. Yeah, please. There's a mic. Oh. So raise your, no, raise your hand. Yeah, it's right down there. Yeah. 
you will turn to it. I want to go to the women. Yes, sure. Yeah. I, I, yeah. So uh, I guess I'm looking at you because I'm hoping you can look at wherever you want, but yeah, go ahead. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> no, so I just wanted to address an earlier point about humanizing. And so the question is for one of the women if they can just tell us about themselves, their kids, uh, what they like to do, eat. Um, so their daily lives. I'm not sure they had one before. This happened to them, and we'd love to hear about that. I would love to hear about that. So, is I'm going to talk about the people who are in the world, and I'm going to talk about the people who are in the world, and I'm going to talk about the people who are in the world, and I'm going to talk about the people who are in the world. عم تخوضوها بالاردن، كيف كان قبل؟ كيف اليوم؟ الحياة اليومية؟ إذا في حدا بيقدر يجاوب؟ بده يعرف عن أولادكم، عائلتكم، شو كنتوا تعملوا؟ شو ليشوفوا الإنسان أكثر من أي شيء ثاني. كنا عايشين في سوريا كثير كثير مرتاحين وكان ما عم يعني ما في عواقب وما في حروب وما في شيء وكانت حياتنا يعني كثير كثير حلوه لحد ما انه صار صار بلشوا يطلعوا المظاهرات اول شيء وصارت صار صار في سوريا كثير يعني حياتي كانت كثير حلوه كانت كيف كانت نقعد جوزي عنده محل عندي بيت جديد عمرته فرشته فرش بجنن <تصفيق> وتحيه لعمر اكثر شيء هذه سامعني حكيت لك يا عمر سامعني اكيد وتحيه لنانا ولشان <تصفيق> و... وما كملت البيت اللي قعدت فيه بس يعني ما عملت يا دوب شهرين وقت طلعوا وقت صارت نزلت الطياره الصاروخ وصارت المزره مشينا من فوق الجثث من فوق القتلة وقطعت البني ادمين عن حيطان، انا ضليتني ثلاث ايام وانا رحت الدم واصرخ ما صابتني حاله نفسيه كمان يعني. ااا آه يعني يعني حياه كانت مؤلمه مؤلمه كثير كثير عبين ما وصلنا على حدود الاردن. وبالحدود كثير حدود تعذبنا كثير كثير لحتى طلعنا من سوريا حتى فوتونا السوريين وبعدين الاردنيين كمان يعني تعذبنا شوي بس كانوا احسن ارحم من السوريا ارحم كثير ارحم بس انا حتجي خلود شو كان كثير لك خلود ساينز تو انسر تو يور كويشن هير لايف واز ا فيري كومفورتبل لايف هير هازبند هاد هيز اون ستور ذي هاد جست بوت ا نيو هوم شي هاز بيوتيفول فرنشر ان هير هاوس until uh, the rockets came falling and until uh, a massacre took place in her area and they had to flee walking over dismembered bodies. Um, and, and it was very painful for them to see, to see this and, and experience this. Um, and they went, uh, of course they suffered until they reached the, the borders to Jordan. Um, they had no compassion whatsoever from uh, the, the Syrian security at the border that they would not want to let them in until they did let them in. And she's saying that the, the security at the Jordanian border were even nicer uh, than those on the Syrian border. Uh, but they went through hell and back by the time they made it. And these were people who were just living a normal everyday life. I think we're actually, I'm so sorry, I keep changing it. I think we're going to bring the rest of the panel, we can explain to the women, we're going to bring the rest of the panel up. Please come to your places at the table. We will continue taking questions from the audience for the women. So hold on to your questions. We're just going to bring some other people in. So we can. Um, uh, it's just now, the rest of the panel will come on the panel. And we will continue the panel with you. So we'll just see you in the next one. But we'll just change the panel. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Oh, come on, come on up here too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. We are lucky now to be joined uh, by several other 
panelists, and you have all of their bios in your programs. Uh, Faisal Tani to my immediate left from the Rafiq Hariri Center um, at the Atlantic Council, Hint Kabawat next to him from the United States Institute of Peace, and Faisal Al-Jaburi, the Executive Director of Bridges of Understanding. I'm going to begin with a question to Hint. And I'm going to try to bring uh, what we've talked about here together uh, back into the lens of, of the more contemporary news. Hint, it's a little confusing hearing this because all we hear about on the news is ISIS and how important it is to go after ISIS, and I'm not denying that. But how then do we understand the importance of the humanitarian situation, the, the citizens of <coughs> Syria. How do we understand how important that is in dealing with this humanitarian catastrophe relative to fighting ISIS? Uh, hello, everybody. I think you have to speak up a little bit. Yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, the question of ISIS, every time lately somebody will mention Syria, they will think it's ISIS. And uh, I'm glad that you see and you witness that we have a big humanitarian problem. And if we want to solve the problem of ISIS, we cannot, it's hand in hand with the humanitarian issues. Uh, uh, I've been going regularly to the refugee camps. And I met this little boy called Mustafa in Atme camp, uh, Mustafa has nothing to do. He's 16 years old, he has no school, he got no hope. Easily, in my other trip to Atme, I couldn't find Mustafa. Mustafa is being recruited by ISIS because he has nothing to do. We've been calling the big organization, UNICEF and others, United Nations, we need to get education for this. ISIS is recruiting our children, our Syrian children, and we need to stop this. I'm glad that everybody knows now how dangerous is ISIS, but we cannot neglect the problem on the ground. Those women, every single woman I met in my trips, I was three weeks ago in Italy, every single woman, they want to go back home. They want to go back home. This is a simple question. They don't want to have barrel bombs or shelling. They want to save their kids. So how to solve the ice problems is also to solve the problem, the humanitarian problem in Syria. Let's not forget the dictator who is the cause of all these problems. So we need to think about it in a full package. We cannot just destroy our ISIS because we cannot leave the ground empty. We need to give those people hope. We need to give this youth hope that there will be tomorrow for them. And they cannot, and they want to go back home. Thank you so much, Hint. That's, I think it's something very interesting that you've told us. We hear a lot about the ideology of ISIS, but if I understand correctly, you're telling us that very often it's simply filling a vacuum as people who <coughs> need money, who need something to do, who need to be able to support their family, and they come along with the money. Uh, Faisal Itani, I'm going to ask you a very similar question, from, uh, but ask you to, to step back from a broader policy perspective. We've seen in the last two weeks a, a rather dramatic shift, both in the American public and in the US policy a shift from what previously, you know, kind of unfazed by three million refugees, nearly 200,000 people killed, six million internally displaced Syrians, kind of unfazed by any of that, with, with a humanitarian response to be sure, but, but not a desire to actually go in and uh, try to do something to change the situation on the ground. Now 70% of the American public is in favor of taking action in Syria, and the President yesterday with the Congress is now taking uh, that action. How do you see the situation evolving and how do you weigh the two demands of the Syrian population and the humanitarian crisis and the ISIS situation? Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, and thank you all for your attendance. 
Uh, you know, the past couple of years, uh, me and my colleagues have been uh, working on the Syria issue in the Washington policy world. And we're sort of screaming our lungs out about the fact that this is important and that only is it causing a great deal of human suffering, but it's laying the groundwork for political security deterioration that's very worrying. Uh, and over the past month, uh, we've gotten a lot more attention than we anticipated, uh, but, uh, and that's good, but uh, all the conversation is about ISIS. Uh, once a week, uh, I shut off my email and my phone and I uh, watch about an hour or two of footage uh, from Syria uh, of uh, things that are actually happening to day-to-day -day people. And, you know, not just the refugees, but just the sheer unfairness and unpredictability and injustice of people's lives there. Just to remember really that this is about this place and these people in it. Uh, not only about their current suffering, but the different directions that, that their lives could take now, what it could mean for us and all the world. Now, uh, ISIS and the regime are the things that happened to, to these people. Not, they're not them themselves, or things of their, of their creation, or things they had any, any say in shaping. Uh, and there are two possible answers, are ISIS and Assad, for where we can go from here for the Syrian population, but there's a whole broad range of slightly more complex answers in the middle uh, that don't get a lot of attention. Uh, there is a robust, active portion of Syrian society that is that has now been mobilized enough to play a role in shaping their future, but us helping shape that is going to be much more involved process than you dropping bombs or dropping some relief supplies, and hopefully at best this ISIS situation can to start a dialogue, a slightly braver, more honest dialogue about what kind of relationship we want to have with the conflict and what we can do for it in the, the way it's heading. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking a really complex situation and giving us a good, clear answer. Derek, I'm going to turn to you for another question. <clears throat> yeah, and then we'll open it up in a, in a moment. As I'm sitting here, I'm, um, I'm struck by, again, by the, um, the question of art and what these women have made and, what, and the stories that they've told and as artistic director of this space and, and having hoped to bring the, the art itself, the stories itself, what art does, the work that art does, uh, 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 not just uh, um, that these stories are there, but how they're told. And Omar and the women's work, this production is extraordinary in how it weaves the ancient Euripides tale and the personal narratives of the women uh, and the sense of, of chorus of community. Um, and of course, we can't, we can just talk about that and show you glimpses of that. So I'm going to turn to um, uh, a friend and colleague, uh, Faisal Al Jaburi, with this uh, remarkable organization, Bridges of Understanding, who we are, are, are thrilled to collaborate with in an ongoing way. Um, and you guys uh, um, traffic in culture and in education. Um, personal diplomacy with intent to foster strong relationships between the U.S. and the Arab world. And in that work, it's so much about narrative and story, I know. And I just wonder, given that commitment and that work, if you could talk from your perspective a little bit about why um, you see this as such an injustice, um, that, that these stories, this is an artistic and a narrative question, that these stories aren't able to make it to the stage we're sitting on right here. Yes, for sure, thank you. And uh, first and foremost, I just sort of wanted, I want to thank you and Cynthia for, um, for one having us as um, partners, uh, as Bridges of Understanding as partners on this Myriad Voices Festival. Um, I think it's important work. And, uh, and also to Charlotte and Georgie for really looking at um, taking this amazing opportunity to showcase um, you know, art as a social movement, but also um, theater as art therapy. You know, really looking at how this has significantly impacted these women. That cannot be discounted in this conversation on a deeply emotional, personal level. Um, you know, I think uh, I'll speak first and foremost as an Arab American myself, and, um, and I think uh, what's really disturbing to me, especially in the Western media, is that we're being, um, we're being defined by our own sort of Hitlers and Mussolinis. You know, that's what our image is that's being put out there into the universe. And, um, you know, it's those personal narratives that are so significant in really shaping that full story. You know, you really need, um, you know, I always say this, it's that, you know, with any major atrocity, 
you really need those Anne Franks that are on the ground, those voices that really show what's happening and help to sort of define the humanity of it all. And what allows those sort of atrocities to, to resonate on a grander, more global scale. There are so many fantastic organizations out there doing great public policy work, um, human rights work, civil rights work, so many statistics coming out there. But those statistics do not resonate until you have a human face to put towards it. And that's what we've seen today with theater. Theater is especially so profound because um, you know, it's the one art form where the humanity of it all can't actually be denied. In front of you, you are having a visceral exchange, the audience with the actors on that stage, especially in a format like this that interweaves the personal stories of these women. That's why this in particular was so important and why it was so important, in my opinion, to, to have a home on an American stage in front of an American audience. Um, you know, and then I think, uh, you know, I think, uh, I don't want to use censorship as the word is, maybe I do, and I sort of pick it up from Omar as well, is it's a really dangerous message to send out there. Um, if, uh, if this type of art isn't given a home globally and isn't championed, um, as a right and a necessity in the, um, in, in, in the movement for global citizenship. And uh, because um, as the uh, British director Richard Eyre says, it's the best theater, the best art, really the art for the ages only comes out of times of complete social upheaval and crisis. That's what you can cling on to. That's its you know, it's, it's when the soul is in crisis that you have great arts um, to share, uh, to share that common, that common humanity. And that's, that's really, that's why this was so important and why we need to make an active effort beyond the film, beyond the documentary that's coming out there to make sure that these women are able to have a voice here in the States. So. Thank you, thank you so much. I think now we're gonna turn back to the audience and honey, would you be nice enough to explain to the women at Omar that we're going to take questions from the audience now? We welcome your questions to the women, to anyone on the panel. I see two questions there. Please oh, hang on just one quick second so you can okay. explain uh, to them. Omar and all the people who are with us, we're just going to take a question from the audience. Maybe you can ask them. Go ahead, please. Uh, just a, is, is you can make a question and, and kind of as quickly as you can would be great to get as many in as we can. Can you hear me? Yes, go okay. right ahead. Um, I just wanted to um, say that my name is Lynn and I photograph the women and work with Charlotte and Georgie and I would like to say hello and you look beautiful. I miss you and we're with you. Mm -hmm. joined and we appreciate it very much by some special guests from the State Department, David Donahue, Principal, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary from Consular a lawyer who gave us so much of his time, Jonathan Ginsburg. If people have questions about the visa issues, I'm going to uh, turn to all of you. But now we're happy to take another question. And we would really welcome the questions for the women, too. Do we have the mic? Warm hello to all the women, and my question for you would be, if you would give us, in a nutshell, a sentence of hope you would write in our hearts as a result of the theatrical work you did, after all you suffered, what would that be? Thank you. A sentence of hope, is that what you asked? To make sure I understood, a sentence of hope? Out of the theatrical world with all the healing that comes along. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you if you can tell me that you are a good person, and 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 you are a good Ask something and answer your question. 
also. Well, uh, I believe that uh, sometimes a few words can say everything. And I would like to thank you all for your support. And uh, I have, uh, I see now that our voice is here. And I hope that uh, the voice of peace will be heard around the world. And come back to my home city. Thank you. Thank you. Honey, will you let the women know that they also may ask us questions? Perfect. <laughs> سيدات عم بقول عم تسمعونا هلا طبعا فيكم انتم كمان تسالوا الجمهور الاسئله اللي انتم حابين تسالوهم يا حابين She's asking for some, she's introducing her beautiful baby daughter. Her name is Sham, which is Damascus. Um, and she's asking, what did you think? What was your impression about what you saw today? Of course, they would have wished that you saw the play itself, but what's your impression? Has their voice, is it reaching you? Has the message been delivered? Asking them what their life is like shows how hungry people are for their stories. Okay. Uh, Russia is asking why 
Why does the State Department reject their visa? <laughs> Recognizing that you know these are not the individuals who made the decision, <laughs> they're, they're the individuals who are brave enough to come and answer that question. So thank you. Thank you. First of all, I want to recognize that this is a night about the ladies uh, from from uh, uh, from Syria who are speaking to us from Amman, and uh, how wonderful it is to have them here on the screen, and how wonderful it is to be here together discussing these issues that are so important to us. Uh, these are real human issues. And uh, on the particular question, uh, first of all, I think it's really important to understand, as, as our friend here has shown, uh, we are a very welcome, welcoming and opening, open country. Uh, we welcomed 70,000 refugees last year, more than everybody else in the world, every country in the world. We. Um, have a, a million people get green cards in America every year. That's uh, a huge number every year, and another 780,000 or so become American citizens every year. So, and every year about 70 million people visit the United States. Many people here want to, are part of the uh, School of Foreign Service, and I hope that you'll join the Foreign Service, but part of the Foreign Service is that Many, many times you get to welcome people to the United States, and sometimes by law, by uh, lack of funds, because a country is, uh, finds itself in the midst of, of chaos, you can't do the things you want to do. You may spend years building a democracy in a country, working for democracy, and have something happen as we are seeing now happening in South Sudan. And it's all your work of, of a decade, maybe and you hope that you can bring it back again. Um, in the case of Syria, we had people who love Syria who were working in Damascus at our embassy there, working with the people, sending many, many Syrian students who are still studying in the United States. So we have a long, long, warm history. But if you want to join the Foreign Service, many, many times you'll do a wonderful, wonderful thing, but you'll face some very tough decisions too. And those are tough decisions that you're honor bound by the law to follow. And so in this case, on their particular, I can't talk about any particular issues or because of privacy laws, but I can tell you that the decision was made, was made uh, appropriately for this particular time and this particular day that they walked into the embassy. A decision was made in, in accordance with uh, U.S. laws, and that is part of being a part of the Foreign Services that you act, you act in, in accordance with U.S. laws. Um, but we certainly uh, are very proud of this presentation and of this welcome here. Uh, and uh, again, I say on that particular day that they did not meet the requirements of the law. So thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think um, we have time for one more question, and then we're going to conclude by showing one final clip. Here's a question right here. There is. Um, by showing a clip of the uh, documentary. So if you can be teeing that up, that would be great. Thank you. Um, I just want to say, I don't have a question. I just have a comment um, about what we thought after we saw the video. Okay, you can make a clip, please. Okay, sure. Um, so, and it's me, Hagar, and I'm a Australian in Georgetown University, Hina. One of the Sukhutais that would in the Ehna Bitta'irku, get them, get them. واحنا حاسين بيكم جدا جدا وانا مش يعني انا فعلا مش اتصور كل الدم وال انا انا اسفه انا بس عايزه اتاسف اتاسف لكم وانا اسفه ان العاميه بتاع عربي مضروبه شويه انا اسفه بس انا بس عايزه اقول ان العرب هنا حاسين بيكم واحنا بنتعبكم وربنا معاكم و الله معاكم.
that uh, we do have one or two people here who speak English, but <laughs> no, but if you if you wouldn't mind translating for the rest of us, what was that? Thank you so much. Um, it, you were saying that um, you, she feels with them, she feels for them, and she's praying for them. Is that correct? And may God be with them. Thank you. Well. I think that is really a wonderful note to conclude the discussion period on, and if we are ready, I think it would be great to end all together with uh, one more glimpse of uh, the performance itself, and then after that, and if you can let the women know, after that, I think we can all stand and, and say goodbye. نحن هلا بس حنحضر هيك ورج جزء صغير من الفيلم الوثائقي بس خليكم معنا لحتى نودعكم بعد ما نشوف هالكم دقيقة فلا تروحوا. And just so all of you remember, we'll have a reception afterwards in the lobby, and and those of us who are here are happy to continue the conversation further. Although we clearly got a lot of experts in the audience, you should seek out also. We're with you, we support you, may God be with you, and, and give you power to keep going and doing what you're doing, is what I'm saying. And if you don't mind, if you can just tell them one more thing, and if you can just repeat after me, um, if we can try in Arabic. <laughs> Okay, Arabic 101. Um, the first word would be Nehna, which means we are. Nehna. Ma'kun. Ma'kun. Means we are with you. 
Hen en makkelijk. Super en even